Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to another week and another session. Uh, let's begin today uh, with a word of prayer. Uh, could one of us please lead us in prayer? Sister Rupa, can you lead us in prayer, please? Sure, sir. Go ahead. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come to your throne of grace with thanksgiving and praise, Lord. Thank you for this new week you have granted us in Jesus' name. As we start our session, Lord, Father God, open our hearts, open our minds to receive your impartation and information about all the your works in the history, Lord. Let them ignite our hearts, set us on fire for you, Father God, to extend the kingdom of God in the places where you have placed us, Master. Anoint your servant and let your words of life flow and touch our hearts in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, Sister Rupa. Well, okay. Uh, so let's just quickly do a quick review of what we did uh, last week. Now, last week, we continued looking at uh, revivalists. We continued looking at the outpouring that happened. Uh, by this time, uh, the entire world is experiencing an outpouring of God. Right? We looked at Smith Wigglesworth. God used this man, an apostle of faith, uh, very powerfully in different parts of the world, known for casting out demons, healing the sick, raising the dead, did a mighty ministry. Then John G. Lake, uh, 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 John G. Lake in South Africa did a great work where uh, more than a hundred thousand converts were seen, and many of them were added into the church. And we also looked at uh, very briefly uh, Charles Fox Parham, who started the Bethel Bible. Uh, college. Now, this is not the Bethel that we know of at uh, Reading, uh, but this was in uh, Kansas. And it was wonderful how, you know, it was just through about, I think it was 40 students. And uh, from those 40 students, you know, outpouring started. People came from different parts of the world to be part of this Bible college because of the outpouring and uh, because that, because God was doing something supernatural in this college. It all started off with 40 students, but now uh, by the early 1900s, the, this college had seen thousands of students coming from different countries to attend their courses. There are times when, <clears throat> sorry, uh, there are times when the students could not sit in the regular classes because such a presence, a heaviness of God's presence uh, in that place. So they put off studying the word for some time and they just spent time in worship and prayer. Uh, and this went on for many days. And one of them who was uh, radically saved during this time was William J. Seymour, uh, who uh, we spoke about with the Azusa Street Revival. Then we also looked at John Hyde, who uh, came to Seal Court, Punjab, uh, American Presbyterian missionary, full of fervor, full of zeal for God, comes into Punjab, learns the language, begins to minister uh, in a small tent uh, in, in Punjab. But uh, all of a sudden, they witness an outpouring. Hundreds of people come in, whole nights of prayer. Uh, they started the Punjab Prayer Union. Uh, people came and stood in the rain during the conventions, and the conventions wouldn't stop. It went on night after night after night, and uh, it was a powerful move of God in Punjab. Then we also looked at uh, Pandit Ramabai, the Mukti mission that happened in Mumbai. Uh, now, even though Pandit Ramabai was more towards helping the widowed Brahmin women, uh, they did see an outpouring uh, in that Mukti mission itself because uh, Pandit Ramabai, even though she had the whole thing of you know helping out uh, women and uh, uh, you know giving them a voice uh, during those times in Mumbai, uh, she earnestly prayed for revival, and this whole Mukti mission uh, saw 
uh, an amazing move of God. It is noted that hundreds and thousands of Brahmins uh, were converted to Christ during that time. And so, uh, so it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a season when God was doing something in the nation of India. Of course, there are, there was revival continuing in other places as well, but something very peculiar uh, was happening in the nation of India. Sadhu Sundar Singh again uh, in a Sikh family uh, from Ludhiana, uh, known for his uh, very. Uh, loving personality. Uh, if we read books about Sadhu Sundar Singh, it is it is said that you know when people saw him, it was like seeing the face of Jesus. It was uh, it was so you know so loving, so kind, so gentle. Uh, yet there was this uh, you know this uh, word that came out from him that so powerful uh, that even demons would flee when he would walk between the paths of these mountains and you know he was known as the apostle of the bleeding feet with the bleeding feet because of the the long long distances that he traveled uh, by foot and so uh, we will carry on from here uh, we will look at a few more revivals few more outpourings uh, and then towards probably the end of this class or maybe the end of next week's session we'll just leave it open to you know get your thoughts get your feedback on uh what do you think about revival what do we need to do as a body of christ uh, you know whether it's our nation here in india or uh, globally as well because it's important to understand that you know when revival starts in one place uh we we talked about this right it's like fire it it eventually spreads to other countries so so yes, we pray for our own countries, but we can also pray for revival in different countries, um, uh, right? So let's start from page 55, if you're tracking along. Another thing is we may not be able to, you know, look at each outpouring and each revival only because of lack of time. So uh, there may be you know, few points that we may skip. Uh, just so that we can get to the important ones and be able to finish uh, our portions at, at on time. Right, page 55. Now, early 1900s saw revival in Korea, right? The church in Korea actually saw seasons of revival. So it was like uh, two years of revival, then there would be a sudden stop, and then again, a two years or a three year revival. So it was seasons. Right. And during this time, prayer became an integral part of the Korean church. Imagine this thousands of people gathered together uh, and they spent time in prayer. Right. Uh, they spent the, Korea is known for its mountainous areas outside of Korea. And so they had something called as the prayer mountains. So they would actually go up the mountain. Uh, and and they would spend time in prayer, right? And these were uh, not just a day or so; they would spend days and nights in prayer. It is said that you know during the Korean revival, uh, those who are working professionals would uh, work, and they would apply for one week of holidays, or you know uh, just taken off for a week. And it was not for you know going and enjoying a holiday, but it was to go and spend the whole week in the prayer mountain. So that was the zeal. That was the fervor that they were living in during that time, right? Why, why was that? Because the, the Holy Spirit had, you know, rested upon each one of them. There was a sense of holiness. There was a sense of conviction. There was a sense of, uh, you know, deep longing for God. And, you know, it's not easy. I think most of us know it's not easy to pray for a whole night. Right? Uh, forget about the whole night. It's not even easy to pray for two hours at a stretch, right? Uh, because there's so many distractions and so many things. Yet, during those times, they prayed throughout the night. And, and it was not by their own uh, you know, physical strength, but it was because the Holy Spirit had brought them under such deep conviction. So Korea saw mighty revivals uh, uh, and later on we'll also look at uh, uh, you know uh, David Yonggi Cho uh, also who was part of these 
revivals uh, and as a young boy he would go up those mountains and he would watch uh, you know what was happening but he was not too fervent but we we'll look at that later on uh, right so korean revival then we see that revival went into north china uh, jonathan goforth was a uh, uh, a canadian missionary he went into china he went into the northern regions of china and the moment he realized that uh, and he saw the korean revival he read about it what is happening he said uh, he started to pray he said god not china i want revival to come here and uh, uh, you know he began to pray he spent many 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 days uh, just seeking god uh, he it is said that he took a few of his church people church folks and uh, uh, he would sit and they would pray together uh, for many hours and eventually uh he saw an outpouring of god he saw that there were many people who came to christ all of a sudden his church was filled with people and there was a sense of turning away from sin and one of the most out uh, you know uh most important outcomes of the of the of the revival that happened in china is that they were able to raise many leaders right now remember that uh, china is a very highly populated country just like india uh, and so as the church was growing uh, later on the communist also came into power and there was a uh, heavy suppression for christianity and all of that uh, but uh, the church continued to grow uh leadership god raised up leaders and small groups was something that god used in especially in china korea small group churches so they may be about uh for example 2000 people in the church uh, but they wouldn't meet in one place it was usually they would meet in smaller groups and uh, uh it was only because later on they saw the communist rule uh and then we see that because of this revival that happened in north china uh an american methodist uh missionary right he uh, his name was willis hoover now he was also part of uh, you know he saw what happened at the mukti mission uh, pandit ramabai's uh, uh, you know uh, mission that happened and all the uh, outpourings that happened there he began to pray uh willis hoover he said god south america chile send an outpouring and here is where even today chile has the most number of pentecostal churches in uh, you know the uh, in the entire uh, i think it was uh, that part of uh, I, i'm not sure if it's the entire world uh, but they have a, a lot of pentecostal churches it was birth during this time now why was it named pentecostal was because the 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 fruit of the ministry or the outcome of the outpouring was more of what happened during the day of pentecost where there was conviction of sin there was speaking in tongues there was prayer there was uh, you know the manifesting of the holy spirit more evident uh, and so they started to you know uh, call themselves uh, the pentecostal uh church during that time and it was somewhere around that time 1914 early 1900s when the assemblies of god was formed the assemblies of god denomination and uh we all know that the assemblies of god are there all over the world even now so uh so early 1900s saw pentecostalism saw uh the uh, assemblies of god as well right uh so as as we go on we also look at revival happening in uh, uh southern china uh where it is said that over 5 million people uh accepted christ as their personal savior china saw a very very uh, powerful move of god it is uh, you know uh, history talks about it it's not in their notes but history says that um there were times when you know uh people would not get up from the prayer and so offices were closed uh, people wouldn't go to offices and uh, they were just sitting there praying for days and, and and so people from different places came to witness this why why is it 
why is it that people are not coming out of this place and uh, when they came to witness it they also experienced um, uh, the move of the holy spirit upon their lives and so we see that you know korea china uh, uh, the 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 outpouring was so evident so powerful that many a times there was no preaching many a times it was just uh, you know a prayer meeting people are just praying together and people have experienced the presence of god a very interesting um, revival or an outpouring that happened was in uh, hebrides island in scotland now uh, i remember reading this many years back uh, this island in scotland uh, hebrides was an island more of a tourist destination right and uh, there were no young people in this church there were only older people so god used two old women to start a revival in this place one lady was peggy smith she was 84 years old and she was blind and another one another woman was christine her name her, she was 82 years old she had uh, uh, arthritis Okay, 84 year old Peggy Smith who was blind, and 82 year old woman who had arthritis. They said, "We've heard about the you know the revivals that are happening all over the world." They were part of a church. They said, "God, we've heard about revivals happening everywhere. Now we want to see a revival." So they began to pray, 10 p.m. in the night to 3 a.m. in the morning. Right. Uh, so what they did was they rounded up a few prayer warriors and they began to pray. 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. 84 years old, blind. 82 years old with arthritis. They began to pray. Three times a week they prayed. And, you know, they began to confess the scripture, Isaiah 44, 3. I'll just read that. For I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessings on your descendants. So they every day they would begin to declare this. God, this is what your word says. This is what your word says. So over three months, they began to pray this. All of a sudden, there was a move of God. Uh, uh, one night as they were praying, the whole place was gripped with the fear of God. The whole community was like, you know, in, in this whole sense of conviction. Uh, one thing very important is, you know, when an outpouring comes, when the Holy Spirit comes, the Bible teaches us that the Holy Spirit brings us under conviction. Right? But he brings us under conviction to righteousness. So even when we look at all these revivalists and these outpourings, remember, when the Holy Spirit comes, he brings conviction. So the first sign of an outpouring is repentance of sins. Uh, a high, intense, uh, you know, knowing that, hey, I'm a sinner and I need a savior. Uh, a high level uh, you know, uh, uh, understanding of what sin and righteousness is. Normally, when we go about life, we may not, you know, uh, understand. We may not, you know, realize, hey, this is wrong, or this is right. Or, I shouldn't have done that. Sometimes we make a mistake, and then we think, oh, uh, I shouldn't have done that. It happens to everyone. But here's the thing: when there's an outpouring uh, of uh, uh, of God, that even the smallest thing will cause so much of conviction in people's heart, even the smallest sin. Right? Uh, it could be just a small lie, yet it will bring a high level of conviction upon people. So people would avoid that also, right? even the smallest of sins. So same thing here. It was, a, it was more of a holiday destination, this island. People came there to celebrate, to have fun, to enjoy themselves. They found that the island saw more... Uh, a lot of tourists coming in, but they're all coming in and they're going into a church. Suddenly they found 600 people gathered outside the church. Of course, there were also localites, people living there. 
and then 600 people standing outside the church. What started with about three, four people praying, 600 people gathered outside the church. They all began to arrive. All the buses and uh, local transport started coming to this church. This was the main center. Where is everyone going? They're going to this small church. And 600 people are gathered there. Uh, buses start to uh, arrive there. And nobody knew what is happening. What is happening? No, there are two old women there praying, and then all of a sudden, everyone wants to go there, and there's a conviction, and God has moved in that place. The Holy Spirit did his own publicity, right? in a sense that nobody had to invite anybody to church. And usually in these places, you have to do some kind of outreach, but nobody had to do anything. The buses, the trains, everything were leading to this church. Why? Because people wanted to go to that church. Uh, the whole island, people fell into trance. They were weeping. They were crying. Uh, many uh, cried for mercy. There was an overwhelming sense of the presence of God. Now, same thing that happened in previous revivals, pubs, dance uh, halls, all of these places were closed. Uh, it was only the work of God. The move of God started in this village. It went on to different towns and different villages. Right? Uh, it is said that, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's this famous saying that uh, girls preach an island dry, uh, meaning that you know these these women who raised up again other uh, girls and women to be prayer warriors. This revival went on for more than four years. And the church began to grow. Of course, there were many other churches, and churches in that island began to grow. Now, the first time I read this, I thought to myself, God used two women in their early 80s, blind and with arthritis. And there are sometimes when we think, we think to ourselves, God, I can't do this. Uh, I'm not able to do this. But I believe that if we have a hunger for God, age is not something that God looks at. God is beyond time, beyond all of these things. Right? Uh, the natural doesn't uh, really you know, change God's plans. So we may be maybe well advanced in our years. We may be just young. Whatever age we are, when we are having that hunger, say, God, we want to see a move of God uh, in, in our city, in our place. And when if we are willing to take that, uh, you know, uh, I would say, I would use the word risk to spend time in prayer and dedicate ourselves for that vision, and God is faithful to answer it. God is faithful to answer it. Here, God used two old women. Imagine if these two women said, I can't do it. I, uh, it's too much. Let, let the young people do it, no? not me. Imagine they said that. They would not have seen a revival. God will not overpower. right? God needs people who will pray. And, and then he answers those prayers. Right? So it's really, uh, you know, the... Every time I, there's a, there's a small article uh, I read a couple of years back on this, which talks about more detail. I forget the name of the article, but uh, remember the Hebrides Islands in, uh, in Scotland saw a great move of God through these two elder women. And um, later on, uh, we see that during this time, uh, uh, there was a missionary service that was started. It's an air service called Jungle Aviation and Radio Service. Now, uh, let me tell you some, uh, you know, uh, give you a, like a bit of a background of how this started. Uh, William Cameron Townsend, Townsend uh, was a man who was in the, um, you know, uh, service. Right? He was in the, uh, he was like a pilot and. Uh, he would fly those, you know, those small helicopters. So he was always asking God, God, you know, I'm I'm into all of this, uh, you know, but I'm not too good at preaching. I'm not too good at uh, ministering to people, but I want to do something for you. 
So God gave him an idea. Uh, and he said, okay, there are many places, as he was praying, he found out that there are many places like jungles and into the deserts and, you know, all these lonely places where people don't have Bibles and they don't have missionaries. So what this man, William Cameron Townsend, did was he said, okay, we will translate Bibles into their linguistics, right? And we will have radio service and we will you know, get missionaries, we will fly them there to that spot and stay there for about two, three weeks, minister to the people, share the gospel. Uh, you know, uh, we will provide for the food, the shelter, everything. And so this missionary is, it's called an air service missionary. And even now, uh, you know, we know of people, uh, there is, I think, Oh, one couple in our church who are here in Bangalore, uh, and and they have applied for this, right? Where they they you have to be a pilot, uh, but you should also be you know uh, uh, quite uh, knowledgeable in fixing the aircraft. So it's got too many technical things, but it's true, and uh, it's an air service missionary basis. And so what they do is they prefer couples. So you, one, you need to be a pilot. You should have basic knowledge on how to repair an aircraft. Uh, when I say aircraft, it's a small, those small helicopters which seats about four people. And so they would go into the, uh, you know, the jungles uh, where people have not gone into tribal areas. They would base camp there. They would begin to slowly reach out, share the gospel with people, and uh, you know, uh, and they would. Uh, give them Bibles, give them food, give them clothing and things like that. So it was a wonderful ministry that had began. Many lives were touched. And many years later, Jim Elliott uh, was a man, a missionary. He, he and his friend Peter Fleming, they were also uh, like pilots. Uh, they were interested in aviation. So they decided, hey, let me join this mission where I can, you know, go fly into these jungles and uh, share the gospel with people. So uh, he set out to Ecuador, South America, and uh, did a ministry there. Then he started working for the uh, Chihuahuas. Uh, and then they reached to another place. And uh, this place is called the Aukis. And there, uh, when they began to minister to the people there, uh, Jim Elliott and uh, there was a team of five of them. They were all killed by the people of Akawa. And here's the thing. Uh, they didn't do much work. But uh, I think there's a movie come out on this. The name of the movie is End of the Spear. Uh, the End of the Spear. It talks about how these young men, so passionate for God, they went into these you know jungles among the uh, tribal people, uh, and they gave their life for the sake of the gospel. Here's what happened after that. Um, many years later, his, uh, you know, after a couple of years, his wife, the, the people who died, uh, especially Jim Elliott, uh, his wife uh, and his small boy, maybe about four or five years old, they went to continue the work there. And uh, they were able to, you know, preach the gospel, touch many lives. And in the movie, it depicts that, you know, that young boy grows up in that same village, learns the language, everything. And uh, at the end, uh, this is in the movie. So uh, uh, in the end of that, uh, uh, end of that movie, it shows that uh, the man who became a believer says, goes to this uh, Jim Elliot's son and says, I'm the one who put the spear in your father's uh, you know, stomach and killed him. Uh, and and then there he says, uh, uh, you know, I forgive you for what you have done. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it only talks about how, you know, they were willing to give their lives. Um, uh, but the story goes on uh, when we read the book. Uh, I don't know the name. I'm not sure of the name of the book. I'm, I, forgive me for not knowing that. I think it is the end of the spear. I'm not sure. Uh, but in the book, it says that uh, uh, when he became a believer, uh, you know, this the man who put the spear into Jim Elliot, uh, later on, he realized uh, what a mistake he made, but he was too afraid uh, 
to you know tell his uh, wife and the, the child and so he was a believer and he stayed on in the church for many years only at the end of his life he revealed it to his wife because nobody knew who killed them uh, well it's a powerful movie i remember once we uh, uh, in our in in our church uh, you know we were we were praying the youth uh, we were having a youth meeting and the youth was uh, saying hey we need to do something we need to pray and i remember one day i told them can we watch this movie uh, you know so we watched this movie the end of the sphere many of them were very touched by what had happened and they began to say you know if god can use them god can use us as well uh, so if you get the, a hand on that movie i'm not sure if it's on youtube as well but you can go ahead and check it the end of the sphere uh, talks about Jim Elliot itself. Then uh, the 1960s to the 1970s was the hippie age, and revival began to start up among the hippies. The hippies were called, later on, they were called the Jesus people. Now, uh, 1950s, 1960s saw rock and roll come in. They saw music, sex, drugs. Uh, the Western world was filled with alcohol, rebellion, sex, drugs, mysticism, communal living. Uh, uh, all of a sudden, America especially saw this this whole outpouring. The work of God was just dampened uh, because of, uh, I would say it was music. Uh, rock and roll and drugs brought things, turned the entire situation around. What saw... Thousands of people going into churches saw thousands of people going into drug-filled concerts and uh, into large stadiums. Yet, there was a young man named Charles Smith and his wife, Kay Smith. They were also, uh, you know, uh, ex-drug addicts and uh, hippies, I would say. And uh, uh, he had a heart for these hippies you know usually during those times they would say okay this guy is a hippie they wouldn't you know communicate to them they wouldn't uh, involve with them say okay these guys are gone case uh they're not going to do anything they have no use all of that but chuck smith uh charles smith and his wife uh did not do that they were they had a heart for the hippies uh, they started a small prayer group of 25 people in calvary chapel God did amazing work. Imagine these drug addicts, hardcore rock and roll, uh, you know, uh, hippies began to give their life to Christ during these prayer movements. 25 people met for prayer. They saw the church growing. Uh, they saw uh, thousands of people coming into the church. Calvary Chapel began to spread out and have different churches around, right? And, and what happened during this time, the early, uh, late 60s, early 70s, was uh, people referred to them as Jesus freak. Why? Because they, uh, they wore bell bottoms and they carried a Bible and they were called Jesus freaks. Uh, uh, the, the, the movement was influential. People began to, you know, come into churches. And since now what happened was the music scene was more of, you know, rock and roll and the music was really good uh, in the world. And so what happened was that same style, that right, the contemporary style was brought in in the church. Now, nothing wrong in that, uh, right? Even uh, the Jesus movement was a contemporary Christian music that started, right? Maranatha uh, singers, hill songs, uh, later on, uh, you know, Jesus culture. All these bands, Petra uh, uh, was a wonderful, you know, gospel band. And uh, the singer of Petra, uh, John Schlitt, was also a drug addict, a hippie. He was in a band. Uh, uh, the name of the rock and roll band was Head East. Uh, and so he also, during this hippie movement, uh, uh, his wife accepted the Lord, then he accepted the Lord, started Petra, Keith Green. Uh, all these are contemporary, uh, you know, music uh, worship that happened in churches. So now in the early uh, 70s, 
we began to see it was no more stand up, sing, sit down, right? Uh, or, or let's sing a song. It was no more like, you know, I wouldn't say dry worship, but it was, wasn't was like a methodical worship. There came in contemporary. There was more of guitars and drums and keyboards. And maybe before that, it was only like an organ that was playing and uh, nothing wrong with that also, right? God has done powerful, uh, you know, there was a powerful outpouring even through that. But there's nothing wrong in this also because, uh, you know, uh, they gave worship to God through all the instruments, guitar music, uh, guitar drums and keyboards and uh, bands started emerging in the early uh, 17, uh, 1970s. And, and so this whole hippie age, uh, God didn't give up on his people. There was a change of heart. People did come in to Christ, Jesus movement. But there were certain dangers that happened during this time. And uh, later on, we, we may look at a few of them. One of the danger was that people started to bring this hippie mentality uh, into the church. Right? So things became even more casual because before that it was more of a high reverence for god later on in the when once the jesus movement started god was doing a wonderful work people were getting saved marvelously yet there was a there was a sense of casualness uh in ministry it was like more of you know uh uh, you know, people were just coming for the music or people were coming for the bands. Uh, but there was no real fruit that was happening in certain cases. Um, uh, we, that's why later on we see that many church organizations during that time didn't like the Jesus movement. They said, don't go there. That's all fake worship and all that. Now, that would be wrong to just put a tag on them saying the entire thing was fake. But... Uh, uh, but people did not like the Jesus movement because they were contemporary in nature. They were not used to a whole band, you know, playing worship songs and all of it. But now we are all used to it. But during the early 1960s, 1960s, 70s, they were not used to it. Right? Uh, God did wonderful works even among the hippies. And the early 1970s, again, uh, Asbury College in Wilmo, Kentucky. Uh, it was a campus, a uh, college campus. Students uh, began to pray and ask God for revival. Uh, there was a large, uh, you know, uh, uh, time uh, or, or a long time that people would, students would spend time in praying. And a powerful move of God broke out in the chapel. And people did not want to leave. Same as what happened in Bethel College in Kansas. The 1,500-seater auditorium was packed. Now, can you picture this? 1,500 people sitting and praying and crying out to God. And what a beautiful picture it would have been. 1,500 young students sitting in an auditorium, praying and crying out to God said that you know classes were canceled for a week even after classes were canceled uh, resumed you know the auditorium was left open so people could come anytime and pray and so most of the time the students were in the chapel uh, sorry this auditorium praying and many lives were touched people from different parts of the world began to come to asbury college because they wanted to see what god is doing there and so Asbury College is even uh, functioning right now. Uh, a few of our church folks have gone there to uh, do their studies as well. Uh, so we see that God was doing his work, right? Even though uh, the hippie movement brought in a lot of sin, a lot of uh, negativity, a lot of uh, the work of the evil one, drugs and uh, sex and alcohol and all of that, Yet God was faithful. God moved in sovereign ways. God used uh, people who were willing to step out of their comfort zone. And, and God brought in revival as well. Let's do the last one and then probably leave a few minutes to uh, just uh, 
wrap up. The last one is uh, the Korean revival, Pastor David Yonggi Cho, who just passed away uh, last week. Uh, now, Korea is already seeing revival, yet there was this this time when uh, uh, David Yonggi Cho, uh, uh, you know, he had many uh, health problems and all of that as a young boy, not really interested in church and all that, but uh, you can go on YouTube, he shares his entire testimony. But after he accepted Christ, he was, uh, you know, radically saved. God had healed him from his sickness. So he said, I'm going to start and I want to see revival in South Korea. And so he started in a small tent in the uh, in, in Seoul, uh, in a small slum, right? Small tent in, in a slum area of uh, uh, Seoul. And he named it the Yoido Full Gospel Church. Now, it started with five people in the church, right? Five people in the church right now. This church is the largest church in the world. Now, how did it become the largest church? Even when you look at, uh, you know, when you listen to his testimony and what he speaks, David Paul Yongicho says, we focused on one thing, prayer and fellowship. And prayer. He said, we spent time praying. So they would go up these mountains, which was already being done during the Korean revival. So David Yonggi Cho would take a few of his leaders, they'd go up the mountain, and they would spend days and days praying. All of a sudden, he saw in the early 1980s, in about five years, he saw 2,000, 5,000 people just being added in very quickly. The church began to grow. And since the church was growing phenomenally, he started something called as small groups. So through the small groups, he said, okay, we cannot manage this entire crowd in one place. We need to divide this. So he started small groups, cell churches. And so the whole thing of cell churches was, you know, uh, uh, it was be had become uh, more usage of cell churches had become more prominent during this time. Right now, we must understand that there would not have been big auditorium seating about 5,000, 10,000 people may not have been there, or even if it was there, they may not have been able to afford it during that time. Uh, so they broke into small churches. Uh, of course, they were all part of the big church, uh, but then they had cell churches. So they had pastors looking after each cell church. And because of these cell churches, the church began to grow even more. Uh, God began to uh, spread. Uh, yes, go ahead, Christopher. Christopher, you raised your hand. Okay. All right. No problem, I think. Okay. So we see that God used, they depend on the Holy Spirit, they prayed, and many lives were touched. The church began to expand rapidly in Korea. And even now, uh, this, this whole ministry of uh, the Yoido full gospel church is doing wonderful work uh blessing many lives in the entire world as well uh, this church is also an evangelistic in nature they send out missionaries to different parts of the world uh to spread the gospel of jesus christ what started with one weak man sick boy uh god healed him and what started with five people has now turned uh, into the biggest church in the world uh, and because that was a powerful move of God, when we pray, God is a God who answers prayers. Right? So we'll close here. Uh, any thoughts any of you have, anything that you want to share, you'd like to share, um, feel free to go ahead and share. I know it's too much of information. You may be thinking, oh, so many people, so many places, so many things. Uh, Yet, uh, as I always say, if you just get the essence of what we are studying, we look at key observations next class. Uh, any thoughts? Any questions? Everyone able to track along? Right? Uh, you're able to get the essence of what we're trying to study here. Uh, 
Yes. Yes, Pastor. It's wonderful. Actually. Okay. Okay. So uh, let me just ask you this question uh, before we close. Maybe some of us can just uh, unmute and answer. What do you think that we should do? Uh, you know, to experience an outpouring of God. What what, what is it that you know uh, uh, we can do as you know as we are studying the Word of God as Bible college students and uh, pastors, evangelists already in the ministry. What is it that you feel we can do uh, that you know uh, that we should press on for uh, for outpouring. What should we do? Uh, what do you? What are your thoughts? Maybe a few of them can just share quickly. What are your thoughts? What What do you think we must do, or why is it that we are not seeing? Why last week we did see that you know, why we some of them said laziness. Some of them said you know we're not willing to pray. So, any thoughts on that? What do you think we must do to see an outpouring? Abhishek Mitra says, communion with the Holy Spirit. All right, good. Yes, thank you. Pastor, I feel like uh, it is uh, actually a deep longing. It's a matter of the heart. It should be, a, there should be a deep longing and hunger in the heart of I the individual, like, you know, our, the group of people. We were really truly long, like David says, like um, in the Psalms, he says, uh, deep calls unto deep. And he says, as the deer pants for the water. So it's the matter of the heart, like when we really long, if, if, when there is a deep longing for his presence, for his work and for his manifestation in our midst. I know we pursue it in prayer. So when we have that deep longing, you know, there is a deep hunger and we go after all of ourselves, like in all of our heart, all of our strength. And that kind of prayer, like, you know, really, I feel attracts God, like, you know, to come into that place and move. So I really feel like, you know, that uh, prayers that come out of such longing is the key for the move of God in our midst, like, you know. So that's what I feel, Pastor. Yes. Thank you, Biela. Yeah, very true. It is the longing, the deep desire to see a move of God, very important. Uh, just like how the two elderly women in uh, Hybrids Island prayed 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. seeking God. Charles says, uh, we do what sparked off the other revivals, prayer and fasting and fellowship. Very true. Uh, prayer, fasting and fellowship. Kennedy says, prayer Pray and seek divine outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Very true. Yes. Anybody else want to share? Samuel, uh, check our intentions. Do we want to make God famous? Do we want God to come and touch lives and change lives? Or even though we say we want God to work, we may be pursuing fame, power. Very, very, very good point, Samuel. That's very true. Many a times... Um, you know, especially when we start off as the church grows or as the ministry goes, grows, we tend to feel that, okay, we are, uh, we need to be, you know, that whole feeling of pride comes in. We feel, okay, uh, you know, uh, I'm the one who did this or I was able to do this. Very important point. Thank you for sharing, Samuel. Check your intentions. If we are, if our intentions you know, we may pray 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Fast and pray. Good. But if our intentions are wrong, uh, then we may, we may not see an outpouring. If our intention is, okay, we want to overtake the other church or we want to be known as the uh, famous church or if, if it's wrong intentions, we may not see an outpouring of God. But yet in that, God is faithful you know, because he's, he's a good God. Even though we pray, we may have wrong intentions. Even through that, sometimes he, you know, he has mercy on us. He blesses us. He brings healing. He brings deliverance. He brings an outpouring. Uh, but if we want to see a true, genuine outpouring, we need to check our intentions. Thank you, Samuel. Uh, Charles, uh, I know you raised your hand. You can go ahead. I, have no time left, but quickly, uh, you can just go ahead and share what you want to say, Charles. Uh, uh, thank you much, mm, very much, Pastor. Uh, mine is the issue of time. The devil has stolen our time, 
in a way that we do not have time. You will observe, as I stated it, prayer, fasting, and the fellowship all involve time. When our intentions are checked, then we will be able to give in time. Yes, God needs uh, our time so that we would be able to fellowship with him, fellowship with the Holy Spirit, and be able to do the work that he has assigned us to do. I think the issue of time also comes in. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Charles, for sharing that. Yes, God uh, uh, expects us to spend time in his presence. All right, let's close. Sorry, I took a few minutes more. Uh, let's just quickly close in prayer. Father, we want to thank you for this wonderful day of God. We thank you for what we've learned. And Lord, even as we look at the day ahead of oh God, we pray that Holy Spirit, you will continue to move in our hearts, in our minds, as we study, as we learn your word. Let this be our intention. Let our intentions be right towards you. Let our eyes be fixed on you. Help us to know that you are there with us, O oh God. And Lord, we speak a blessing over each and every student, O oh God. Uh, may your continual outpouring the manifestation of the Holy Spirit be released in each of our lives, oh God. We thank you, God. We give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for joining. We'll catch up tomorrow. Have a great day ahead. God bless.